This course covers the requirements for all safety operating a vessel when entering and ending the uh, marina, boating in a constricted waterway, and understanding accident reporting requirements and security measures in place when sharing the waterway with vessels carrying certain cargo. Those who successfully complete this course will be able to undertake the duties and responsibilities of operating a vessel in a safe manner while on the Arthur Kill. The objectives of this course to understand the specific hazards of operating a recreational vessel in the Arthur Kill waterway, understanding the security responsibilities for recreational needs, understanding the inland rules of the road and environmental equipment expectations for vessels using Carteret Marina, knowledge on how to report an accident or incident, Understand the function of the U.S. Coast Guard and the Vessel Traffic Service System. It's important to note that this course is not a substitute for the required New Jersey State Boat Safety Course. So what are the recreational boat safety course requirements for the state of New Jersey and the state of New York? For New Jersey, a mandatory operator education certification program that affects two classes of boat operators. All persons who were born after December 1978, regardless of the type of boat operated, and all persons who operate a power watercraft like a jet ski, must complete an eight-hour classroom-based boat safety class and obtain a New Jersey boating safety certificate issued by the New Jersey State Police. Minimum age to operate a power boat is age 13. Ages 13 to 15, the boat's engine must be less than 10 horsepower. No power watercraft operation is permitted until the operator has reached age 16. Each power watercraft operator and boater born after 1978 must have a state certification in their name and possession whenever the boat is operated. For the state of New York, as of January 2006, all operators who are 14 years and older must successfully operate a boat safety education court to operate a personal watercraft in the state of New York. Those who are 18, 10 to 18, also have boat safety education certification to operate any other motorboat unless accompanied by someone who is 18 or older. This course will also inform you of the responsibilities of recreational boat operator when operating in a narrow waterway that is shared with commercial deep draft vessels and vessels that are restricted in their ability to maneuver. The Carteret Marina is located in the Arthur Kill, approximately halfway between Raritan Bay and the Kill Van Gull. The Arthur Kill is a tidal strait separating Staten Island from the mainland New Jersey. It is a major navigational channel for the port of New Jersey and New York. The majority of Arthur Kill Mark Channel is 250 yards wide. This is chartlet of the Arthur Kill. The map shows the many industrial facilities that dot the landscape along the river. Many activities are always ongoing by delivering goods to port and shipping goods from port to call. Commercial shipping activities occur at all hours of the day and night, in good and bad weather, and they leave no port without warning. So stay alert while boating. It's important to remember that the minimum safe distance for any industrial or commercial facility, dock or pier or bulkhead, is important. Here are some of the relevant international and domestic guidelines that all boaters should be familiar with. The U.S. Department of Transportation Inland Navigational Rules, Inland Navigational Rules of 1980, U.S. Coast Guard Authority and Requirements Regarding Boat Safety and Environmental Laws, and the Regulations Including Waterway and Management. Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002, the Security and Accountability for Every Safe Port of 2006, and finally, you should be familiar with each state and their particular laws and regulations pertaining to recreational boating. Let's review some of the definitions that everyone understands what we're talking about. 
A recreational vessel is defined as a vessel that cannot be used for commercial operations. It is not a public vessel, nor is it a vessel for hire. A deep draft vessel is a vessel used for commercial use and has limited maneuver capabilities in a marked channel of sufficient depth. Usually it's a vessel that is used in coastal or international trade. A public vessel. This type of vessel is owned or operated under a command of a local, state, or federal governmental agency or non-commercial use. Narrow channel. This means that navig navigational waters of a U.S. shoreward or navigational demarcation lines divide the high seas from the harbors, rivers, and other inland waters of the United States. Vessel restricted in their ability to maneuver means that a vessel, from the nature of its work, is restricted in the ability to maneuver and therefore is incapable of keeping out of the way of another vessel. Examples of vessels restricted in their maneuverability include a vessel engaged in a towing operation, a vessel engaged in laying, servicing, or picking up navigational marks, submarine cable, or pipeline, a vessel engaged in dredging, surveying, or conducting underwater operations. This is a very busy commercial port complex that includes tugboats with barges, container ships, petroleum and bulk container carriers. Commercial carriers without exception are limited in their ability to maneuver in the narrow waterways and therefore must remain in a marked channel. So extreme caution must be used by boat operators when entering or exit the marina. According to the rules of the waterway, commercial Vessels, due to their size and maneuverability, have the right of way. For this reason, it's important to keep your boat a safe distance away. It takes a commercial carrier anywhere from 5 to 15 times its length to come to a complete stop. So when departing the marina or using the waterways, hear what we ask you to do. Use caution when entering the waterway. Wait for commercial traffic to pass. Use a sound device when entering the waterway. Have your radio on and monitor channels 13 and 16. Do not pass too close in front of a commercial vessel. Limit your speed. Keep attentive to your surroundings. If it's safe to do so, transit outside the marked channel. And finally, be attentive and cautious to any blind spots in the waterway. We show you some of the buoys. These buoy locations can be found on the NOAA chart 12331 and 12333. Areas along the Arctic Hill that may limit visibility, including waters in the vicinity of buoy two, as shown in the map. Between buoys 10 and 16 and buoys 18 and 20. Finally, areas along buoy 36 and Elizabethport. The Arthur Hill contains a major shipping channel with very large tankers, barges, tugboats, and very large ships. Recreational boaters must be extremely vigilant of the very large ships that they will not see you in particular. There are also very strong currents in the Arthur Hill, so vessels may have adequate horsepower and be aware of the tidal table. Other pertinent navigational rules for a narrow channel that is shared with deep draft vessels and vessels that are limited in maneuverability include safe speed. So every vessel should provide a safe speed in order to take the proper and effective action to avoid collision and stop within a distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions. Consider the state of visibility. Look at traffic density of fishing vessels and other vessels that may be underwater. Look at the stopping distance and turning ability in prevailing conditions. The presence of background light from shore or backscatter from a vessel, the sea state, the wind, the current, the proximity of navigational hazards, and find the draft based upon the water depth. When there is the risk of collision, every vessel shall use all available means based upon prevailing circumstances 
and the conditions to determine risk of collision exists. If there's any doubt, the risk shall exist. Here's some of the actions to consider to avoid a collision. Alter the course or speed to avoid the collision, and that should be large enough to be ready apparent to another vessel and observe visually or by radar. If there's sufficient sea room, altercation of course alone may not be the most effective action to avoid close quarter collision. Actions taken to avoid collisions in another vessel shall be such as to result in passing at a safe distance. If necessary, avoid the collision or allow more time to assess the situation. A vessel may slacken her speed, take all the way off by stopping or reversing her means of propulsion. Finally, a vessel which, by any of these rules, is required not to impede the passage or safe passage of another vessel, shall be required by the circumstances of this case, take action to allow sufficient sea room for safe passage of that other vessel. A vessel proceeding along the course of a narrow channel or fairway shall keep as near to the outer limit of that channel or fairway, which lies at a starboard side, as is safe and practical. A vessel left of 20 meters in length or a sailing vessel shall not impede the passage of that vessel, which can safely navigate only within a narrow channel or fairway. A vessel shall not cross a narrow passage or fairway if such crossing impedes the passage of that vessel, which can safely navigate only within that channel or fairway. The latter vessel must use sound signal prescribed in Rule 34D if it's doubt that is the intention of that crossing vessel. A vessel nearing a bend or an area of narrow channel or ferry with other vessels may be obscured by intervening obstruction, shall navigate with particular alertness and caution and sound the appropriate signal. Any vessel shall be anchored in a narrow channel, should avoid this. Note, the entire Arthur Kill waterway is considered a narrow channel since commercial vessels are limited in the way they can maneuver. In the state of New Jersey, there are vessel speed restrictions. All vessels should be operated at a speed that allows time and distance to take necessary action to avoid a collision. Check with your local boating authority before heading out in the water and determine the speed limits in your area. Determine a safe boat speed Take into account the following factors, the visibility conditions, the wind, water conditions and currents, traffic density, types of vessels in the area and their proximity to you, vessel responsiveness, the approximation of navigational hazards and the depth of the water. Lastly, your weight can cause damage to property and other vessels. Always take into account the effects of your weight when they create adjusting your speed. Operating in heavy traffic. When a boat is in heavy traffic, the many boats moving in different directions can cause changes in speed. The boat operator must be able to slow down or stop in order to navigate safely. When operating in a narrow channel, stay to the starboard right side of the vessel. Use a prolonged blast to announce your approach to vessels that may be around the bend. Vessels must keep clear or near and safe as practical to the outer limit of a narrow channel on their starboard side. Sailing vessels and vessels less than 65 feet and left cannot block passage of a vessel that may restrict its navigation to a narrow channel. That includes no recreational boaters traveling in the main channel. They should be giving way to larger vessels such as tugboats. Operating near large vessels, Near a shipping lane or areas in the high boat traffic, small craft are not easily visible to larger vessels. Always keep a lookout for larger vessels and be prepared to yield to right away. Specifically, always steer well clear of vessels in tow, dock ferries, or ferries in transit. 
Be mindful of cables or lines pulling other vessels. The cable line may be submerged and difficult to see. Do not get in between the towing vessel and its tow. Keep an ear out for a long prolonged bass of a horn. This may indicate a departing dock. Operators of small craft should attempt to travel in a group that is possible in order to be more visible. In the state of New York, vessel speed is generally limited to five nautical miles per hour within the 100 feet of a shore, a dock, float, pier, raft, or other anchored boat. There may also daytime and nighttime speeds imposed. There are no speed limit posed. Vessels must always operate safely as not to endanger others. A vessel must not be able to stop within a cleared space ahead. Boat operators responsible for their damage are caused by the vessel's wake. All boat operators must be operated in a responsible manner and in accordance with the capacity plate and speed restrictions. Failure to do so is considered reckless and careless operation. Except in the event of emergency, it's unlawful to anchor or operate a vessel in a way that's unreasonable that may interfere with the navigation of other vessels. When performing a U.S. Coast Guard auxiliary safety check, here are some of the required and not required items. What type of items should be checked? Anchors and lifelines, navigational lights, sound producing devices or bell, voice communications, life jackets, and throwable float devices, fire extinguishers, visual distress alarms, backfire flame control, radar reflecting devices. While not required in all vessels, these other items are strongly recommended. A VHF, FM, marine radio with digital selective calling system, dewatering device and backup, mounted fire extinguisher, anchor and line, first aid kit, person and water kit, toolkit, oars, paddles, and binoculars. During the vessel safety check by the Coast Guard, the visual examination will discuss with the rec recreational boater the purpose and the specific nature of the safety equipment. He or she will clarify federal and state regulations which will discuss certain safety procedures and will answer any and all boating related questions. During this U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Safety Check, all vessels that are renting berth space in a marina must participate in a free U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Safety Check program. Vessels passing this safety check will be awarded a U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Decal that informs law enforcement and safety agencies that your boat is in full compliance with all federal and state boating laws during the safety check for that year. If your boat does not pass, no citation will be issued. Instead, you are provided a written report in how to correct the discrepancies. Vessels will have 60 days from that time their slip is rented to complete the first safety check. When a boat operator is operating based on privilege and vessel registration and it becomes suspended because of repeat violation of speed or reckless operation, they should be required to take a boat safety course as a condition of sentence. Judges do have the option of requiring a violator to take boat safety class for any violations of speed or reckless operation. Federal and state laws prohibit throwing or discharging or discarding any refuge into U.S. coastal waters. Pollution reporting is required by the U.S. Coast Guard for any oil or other hazardous chemical substances, discharge of garbage into navigable or inland waters. Recreational boats with toilet facilities must have operational marine sanitation devices on board. Marina waters and waterways adjacent to New York Harbor are a no discharge zone where treated or untreated waste is completely prohibited. Vessels containing petroleum or some Chemicals in bulk tankers or tank barges are known as red flag vessels, and they have a designated security zone around them. Red flag vessels are identified by a red flag flown by the tugboat or a red flag that's on the vessel itself. In such cases, 
do not approach close to 100 yards from any cruise lines or commercial shipping vessels. Slow to no wake, speed within 500 yards of any U.S. naval vessel, and observe all other restricted areas such as dams, power plants, and other areas. The security zone is regulated by the U.S. Coast Guard and enforced by all law enforcement agencies. Boaters should be aware of following homeland security measures and act accordingly to keep our waterways safe and secure. For information in port areas, you can call 1-800-682-1796 or you can check with your local authorities. Do not stop or anchor beneath a bridge in any channel. Report any suspicious activity immediately to local authorities, the Coast Guard, or Marine security personnel. Or you can call the National Response Center Terrorist Hotline, 1-800-424-8802. Do not approach or challenge anyone that may be acting suspicious. Never confront anyone at all. The Vessel Traffic Service actively monitors and provides navigational advice to boats in particularly confined or busy waterways. The mission of the VTS or the Vessel Traffic Service is to instill order and predictability of the waters of the Port of New York and New Jersey by coordinating vessel movements. They encompass a wide range of techniques and capability aimed at preventing vessel conditions ramming and grounding in the harbor, harbor approach, and inland waterway phase of navigation. BTS is designed to expedite ship movements, increase transport system efficiency, and improve all weather operating capabilities. New York VTS is channel designation channel 11 at 156.55 megahertz, and channel 14 at 156.7 megahertz. Accidents must be reported to New York State Marine Patrol within five days. According to New York State law, accidents are reportable if they meet one or more of the following requirements. Someone is killed or missing. Personal injury beyond first aid. Total property damage that exceeds $1,000. Failure to do so may result in the fine of $100. In the state of New Jersey, Boating accidents will result in personal injury or property damage in excess of $2,000 must be reported within 10 days to the New Jersey State Police, Marine Patrol. If you're involved in accidents, you're required to stop, identify yourself and your boat, provide assistance if possible and warranted, take down pertinent information with dates, times, and conditions, file an accident report with your local law enforcement agency, including federal law. Failure to do so or provide assistance or identify yourself when involved in an accident can result in stiff fines and even imprisonment. On the federal level, the boat operator owner of any recreational boats is required to file a boating accident report with the U.S. Coast Guard. If the boat is involved in an accident that results in any of the following, loss of life, person disappears from the vessel under circumstances that indicate either death or the person may be injured. Injury that requires medical treatment beyond first aid. Damage to the boat or property damage greater than $2,000 or amounts to the local for the state and laws. This applies to amount required reporting to the U.S. Coast Guard. Boat operators are required to report their accident to local authorities in the state where the accident reported. Immediate notification is required for all fatal accidents. If a person dies or goes missing as a result of the recreational boating accident, the nearest state boating authority, along with the U.S. Coast Guard, must be notified without delay. The following information must be provided. Date, time, and exact location of the accident. Name of the person who died or went missing. Number and name of the vessel. Name and address of the owner and the operator of the vessel. It's important to note that the master or the person in charge of the vessel is obligated by law to provide a system that can provide safely when any individual is in danger at sea. The master or person in charge is subject to a fine and imprisonment if failure to do so.
The New Jersey Department of Protection and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has additional requirements for slip and vessel operation. Boater operators shall separately complete an annual Carteret Marine Safety Training Course. They also complete a U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Training and Boat Inspection. They shall not perform boat maintenance within the marina. They shall install a radar reflecting device on every vessel. Monitor VF channels 13 and 16. Be prepared for wakes and water displacement from passing vessels. Moor their vessel for conditions expected from passing commercial vessels. And operate at their own risk. Floating, submerged, or semi-submerged objects may be present. And finally, boaters shall observe the vessel traffic signal that's installed. As indicated on the screen, in the yellow circle, there's a light, a unique operational environment in which Carteret Marina exists. The following safety measures have been installed and will be enforced at all times. A vessel traffic signal has been installed at the entrance of the marina and is located in a southerly wave attenuated. Traffic signal faces north toward boat traffic preparing to exit the marina. This traffic signal uses cameras to sense the potential presence of larger vessels approaching the marina from the north and the south. Boaters are reminded that not all vessels, including small or large vessels, barges or vessels in tow, may trigger the signal. Therefore, caution and intention to all surroundings must be exercised at all times. Boaters are reminded that this signal does not control vessel traffic in the Arthur Kill or passing vessels will not stop or alter their course to accommodate vessels entering or exiting the marina. Additionally, vessels exiting the marina will only be permitted to make a right southerly turn and must proceed a south a safe distance to establish a safe environment in which they can turn and begin a northerly course. Boaters shall only exit the marina when permitted by the marine vessel traffic signal. A steady red signal indicates the vessel with limited maneuverability is near or close to the mouth of the marina entrance. While the red signal is illuminated, boaters shall remain a safe distance at the mouth of the marina and not exit or enter the marina. A flashing yellow signal indicates the signal has not been identified by any vessel with limited maneuverability that is approaching near the mouth of the uh, marina. Boaters may enter or exit the marina while exercising caution and remain aware that not all vessels may trigger the warning system. Boaters are reminded that the fastest currents and turbulent water conditions generated by passing vessels may exist near the wave attenuators and entrance to the marina, and they may ex exist at the extended period of time before or after a large vessel has passed the entrance. Boaters are cautioned to remain clear of the area until a yellow signal appears and the water conditions have calmed. Vessels are not permitted to moor themselves to the wave attenuator or steer pier while awaiting vessels in the Arthur Kill to pass. In the event the signaling system is not operational, it appears red for an extended period of time without any obvious vessel traversing the Arthur Kill, the boater shall immediately contact the Carteret Marina Harbor Master for further information. All boaters are provided with copies of the following safety and informational guides which must be reviewed annually at the time the marina safety training course is given. This includes a quick reference guide to the U.S. Coast Guard Rules of the Road, the Carteret Marine Vessel Safety Course developed by ABS Consulting, Lifeline brochure from the American Waterways Operators, and reviewing the marine guides to the Port of New York and New Jersey video. The marina is under constant electronic surveillance by the New Jersey State Police. Mm -hmm. Failure to comply with the slip license, lease, dock rules, procedures, and any operational requirements will result in slip license, lease, termination. Put
of New York and New Jersey is the busiest port on the east coast of North America. It's a highway that everybody has to share. It's a unique harbor and they have so much activity with all different sized boats. You got kayaks, you got sailboats, you got little motor boats. You have a major shipping channel with large container ships and oil tankers and barges, as opposed to a typical recreational boating harbor where you don't have the shipping traffic. The sailboat guys always complain about the motorboats. Motorboats always complain about sailboats. Ferries get in everybody's way. It's endless. When you're dealing with a ferry and a cruise liner, it gets confusing and kind of dangerous. There's a lot of inexperienced people out here, and, and not everybody understands the rules of the road. 12-year-old learning to sail at rush hour on a Friday when there's 30 ferry boats running around. That can be a, a bit of a conflict. There's very little communication out there. Sometimes it's tough to know the other vessel's intention. A lot of people think they go down the water, they cannot get hurt. You could get killed. It's a mixed-use highway, and everybody thinks they own a piece of it. I don't know what the answer is, but it's our job to make it work. There's a cargo ship coming in. She's 965 feet long, 106 feet wide, and draws 42 feet under the water. Enter the pilot to guide her through the narrow channels and congested fairways of New York Harbor. Most vessels come right up across the ocean to make the dock at a certain time. Ships do not want to wait. We won't make them wait. We are always there. We're heading off to board now, and we'll be bringing her on into the port of New York. That's about 10 or 11 decks. Luckily, this ship has an elevator. Captain Bill McGovern, welcome to New York. Last port? Last port? Last port. Uh, last port, Shanghai, China. Straight from Shanghai yeah, here. Yeah, oh, yeah. very good. This pilot is well aware of what's going on up ahead as opposed to a captain. For all the ports they go to, it would be absolute overload to try and comprehend all the stuff that might be going on in a port. And that is the necessity of the pilot. It's the NYK Meteor. We're inbound approaching the entrance buoys ambulance. Thank you, Captain. You one whistle. Have a nice day. You too. We have a tanker outbound coming towards us, ferry traffic things shooting across us from side to side. By that buoy, there's a small boat, but unless you look carefully, it looks just like the water. It looks like another white cap. There's one cutting right in front of us. What the heck is he thinking? Here we can see another one. And there's another boat right up there ahead, sitting in the same line. We don't know what is going through the mind of the boater. We can communicate with other ships, but we have no idea what that boater is thinking. We have a blind spot 500 meters ahead of the ship. You assume that I see you and I may not. If that engine conked out at the wrong time, there is nothing, nothing that can be done. A lot of people don't realize the displacement of a ship that's 20, 30,000 tons of water filling a void will suck you in pull you right up into the ship. It could end your life. A container ship or tanker can't leave the channel, and they can't back it up. If they reversed engines, the water would move away from the rudder, not past it, losing the ability to steer. The ship would veer out of control, causing a puncture in its hull that could spell disaster for the harbor. This is a stressful, stressful situation. Three, four, three. Heading three, four, three. Very good. As a pilot, you really have to figure out everything that might go wrong and prevent that. Here's our tugboat coming now, Captain. This tugboat is going to be coming alongside. Stop the engine again. Stop the engine. Engine stop, sir. Very good. 
The docking pilot will relieve the Sandy Hook pilot and take us up to the dock. We can dock a lot quicker with tugboats. These dredges can't move. Captain Piver with the tug is maneuvering in between the small gap. This harbor, it's our life. It's what we're entirely dedicated to, keeping it safe and protecting it. And that's why we ask to please leave the channel if a ship is coming. Just go on the outside of it. Smart boaters, do your part. Steer clear of the channel. If you are broken down, walk out on deck, take something bright, and wave your arm to show us that you are disabled. Before you hit the water, check out the Safe Harbor online for safety tips, local resources, and more. The Port of New York and New Jersey is a highway, but it's also a public space. Recreational paddling is exploding. It's on a huge growth curve, and as a kayaker, it's like the Wild West down there. You have ferry traffic, you got recreational boaters. It's tough out there. My biggest problem with kayaks is that I can't see them sometimes. So you don't see it until you're right on it, and then it might be too late. Sometimes there's groups of four or five of them right smack in the middle of the channel. Sometimes they're moving, sometimes they're just sitting still. I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be on one out in the river. <laughs> the waterfront is being open to the people. I think all of our job is to nudge it along just a little bit in that direction. When we launch, I want you to be aware of a couple of things. Number one, I've been paddling on this river for 29 years. <laughs> 29 years. This might be one of the most diverse boathouses there are. We have touring kayaks, sea kayaks, outrigger canoe singles, outrigger canoe doubles. Very few boats that we don't have in the paddling world that come out of here. Tonight we teach people an accelerated paddle basics class. They introduce them to the river and to the currents in our river and all the vagaries. I'm Margaret Mann. I've been paddling in New York Harbor for about eight years. I paddle for recreation and to escape from the city. It keeps you alert, because if you're not, the consequences could be severe. We staged that collision. I wasn't in that boat, and I'm really glad I wasn't. One of the more difficult situations is where you have boathouses, like we created on the west side of Manhattan, directly proximal to high-velocity ferry terminals like the one at West 39th Street. Crossing that path really creates a difficult situation where everybody has to be more alert and aware. Sometimes we'll get some really, really close calls. You assume they see you. It's a 100-foot vessel, but sometimes uh, they're oblivious. You just never want to assume that the other person knows what they're doing or sees you. So you always err on the side of caution. When you're in a kayak approaching a ferry terminal, the first thing you do is hold to read the traffic, to get a sense of when the right moment will be to cross. Usually these ferries, they're not paid to sit at the dock very long, maybe two minutes, three minutes tops. If you see a group of kayaks, you'll know that they're going to be just about behind you when you're ready to pull out. So you wait, watching the terminal for boats coming out, and watching the river, north and south, for boats coming in. You have a fairly decent view, but uh, there's always that blind spot behind the uh, ventilator there, and just about anybody could sneak behind you. Never try to sneak across a ferry backing out. Always wait until it's left the terminal, if they could actually make some sort of uh, visual uh, signal, a hand wave, it's uh, greatly appreciated on our part. Let's do it. Probably the most challenging place to paddle in New York Harbor is the battery. Boats come from all directions. There's no clear channel to paddle in. It's hard to know where to be. So you want to make your intentions very clear. Either wait or paddle. 
But when you make that decision, it should be very clear to the other vessels, and you need to act decisively and quickly. You have to wait for your opening, and you want to aim for its stern. You don't want to cross in front of its bow unless you are positive you have enough time to get across. You can't stress enough how difficult it is to see a kayak on the water. Visibility can be a real issue out in the Hudson River. We just assume that we're invisible, that the other motorized traffic doesn't know you're there. The main way we manage that is we wear bright clothing. We usually have bright vessels. And if we're working in the evening, we have lights. If you're gonna paddle at night, you need to be seen. So you put a, a white light on your stern for the back of your boat. Especially in the city where there's so much white light, it's really important to have green and red lights to distinguish you as a vessel. The green is always on the right and the red is always on the left. It helps a boat that's looking at millions and millions of city lights see something red and green, and they're just, a captain's eye is just trained to see it, to see you as a vessel instead of just another white light in a city of white lights. Even with lights, your visibility at night is extremely limited. So stay close to shore and be alert to other traffic. Even in this intensely urban environment, I'm absolutely connected to nature. I'm feeling the current, I'm feeling the wind, and you're responsible for your personal safety. Nobody else is responsible. Whenever I come off the water, I feel like I've had an adventure, you know, uh, right here in Manhattan. I've had this amazing encounter with nature. I think here's the takeaway for commercial boaters when, in reference to uh, operating around kayakers. Don't assume that we actually are uh, experienced or competent kayakers, and don't, don't even assume that we are uh, uh, necessarily in, in total control. Give us a little space. We'll give you a little space. I promise we will make as, as much of an effort as you will, and I think we can all do great out here. A great assistance to us with uh, ascertaining who's going to cross whose bow is when a paddler will uh, lift his paddle out of the water and maybe over his head, or a hand wave. It's a great idea if they could actually make some sort of uh, visual uh, signal to each other to establish who's going to cross whose bow. Radios are great, VHF is great, but it's not exactly the easiest thing in rough, bumpy water like this to be able to drop your paddle, pick it up, and answer. All in all, though, it's a good idea to have one, at least in your hatch. Know what the river is doing before you hit the water. Make yourself visible, and then assume that you're not. But most of all, take a guided tour or safety course from a local outfitter before you attempt to navigate the strong currents and congested fairways of New York Harbor. Try to make eye contact if at all possible. Uh, we're certainly looking for you. If you see a kayaker in distress, you're gonna know it. Capsized boat, hands waving in the air, any of those kinds of things that are clear signs that that person needs help. Recreational paddling is exploding. So you're gonna get some yahoos out there who are new and don't really understand where they should be and where they shouldn't, and those are the ones that you gotta watch out for. Before you hit the water, check out the safe harbor to learn more about guided tours, internet resources, and where to learn how to paddle safely in the port of New York and New Jersey. People learning to sail can be a problem. They can't get out of our way as well as we'd like them to. Sailboats are sometimes difficult to see the, what directions they're heading in. Either going with the wind, going opposite the wind, they tend to change the direction every five seconds, you know? It's, it's confusion. Kind of dangerous. The port of New York and New Jersey has been a sailing destination for hundreds of years, but today, Sailors share the water with many boaters who don't understand how they navigate or how to read their intentions. My name's Kate 
Chase Field. I'm a captain here at Classic Harbor Line on the schooner Adirondack, and we're going to be taking a sail down to the Statue of Liberty and back. So that's the signal for backing up, engines in reverse. Gonna watch for traffic as we come out of the piers. Uh, we've got one boat coming down the river, but not too close. We'll be out of his way, no problem. Nihon kara kimashita de hajimete no New York no ano kankpo nande. Statue, jiu no megami o mino tarashimi ni shite mas. This trip is really special to me because we're gonna go by the Statue of Liberty and. You know, my family did come through Ellis Island, and it's kind of amazing just to see how they came to the United States. Raising sail is a very vulnerable time. A lot of my attention goes towards making sure that the rigging is running properly. I really have reduced maneuverability. I have crew that are working with sails that are part way up, so they're not really able to adjust them at that point. So it's harder to get the boat to go where you want it at this stage. We really need to stay into the wind, so we can't really turn very quickly. At this point, our engines are going to go off. Our sails are going to go way out, and we're sailing down the river. Kind of have to think two steps ahead when sailing all the time, because we actually can't go in every direction that we want. Right now, I have the Spirit Cruise boat off my port side on the left here, and I also have this tug and barge off my starboard side here on the right. And right now, I'm sort of threading the needle between them. So what I'm going to do is kind of let the Spirit Cruise go by, let the tug and barge go by, then we'll dive over to the other side of the river when we have a clear path to get over there. Ready to jive? In the middle of a jive is one of our most vulnerable times. Jive ho! Perhaps the most reduced maneuverability that we have. The main thing that it means is that we're switching course. Visibility in front is limited. We have the sails and we also have the rigging. It's much better for boats to be sort of behind us than directly in front of us. The most troublesome other vessels that we have out here are small recreational power boaters. As soon as they start to come too close up towards the bow, if we get a gust of wind, it can have our course change a little and can end up having it change right towards them. The wider the berth we can have, the better. 200 feet at least, as a minimum. Jive ho! We try to get to the Statue of Liberty in the cleanest route we can, the shortest route that we can. Generally, we can't stop. If there's any wind in our sails, those sails are going to keep us moving, whether we want to move or not. I have to sort of turn all the way up around towards the wind to stop the boat, and that takes some time. Wow. This is the closest I've ever been to the Statue of Liberty. It's amazing. <laughs> Yay! My ancestors, they would have been on a sailboat, and it was the way to sort of get a sense of what they must have felt like. That was, that was special. I just feel really fortunate that I get to live right over there, but spend my days out here on the water in the sun. We like to get as many people out here every summer as we can to experience that with us. Give all sailing vessels plenty of room. Sailors change course quickly, have limited visibility, can't stop, and are vulnerable when raising sail. To learn more about sailing basics, local resources, and protocols, check out the Safe Harbor online. You've got to be aware that there are motor boaters out there that really don't have a clue. You don't know exactly what they're going to do. You don't necessarily feel like they're paying attention. So yeah, there are times when I see a motor boater and I'm a little anxious. Any wackadoodle can buy a mega yacht. The salesman will give them 20 minutes of how to run the boat and let them loose. And they have no idea how much damage they could cause. A 30-foot boat moving at 30 miles an hour. Before you know it, you can be on top of somebody. So it's really defensive driving. You're just looking around 360 and uh, watching where everyone's going, you know, making sure that you're not cutting in front of somebody else or somebody else isn't cutting in front of you. It is a free-for-all out there. It's definitely a free-for-all. My name is Jim Chambers. 
I've been a captain on vessels in New York Harbor for over 50 years. I've run everything from police boats to ferries, the Adirondack 2, the Manhattan, the Spirit of New York. I made a career out of being the most available relief captain in New York Harbor. But now I am uh, pretty much retired and playing on my own vessel, the Osprey, for fun and pleasure. Recreational boating in the Port of New York is growing at great strides. The waterfront's being rediscovered in the city. For a period of time, nobody thought about going in the Hudson River. You know, it's just so polluted. And now it's cleaned up. A lot of boating, a lot of recreational pursuits. Look at a number of people out here enjoying New York Harbor. There's some of the things to worry about. Swift currents, the tide runs very fast through here. And you've got wakes to deal with. Sailboats don't leave a wake. Kayaks don't leave a wake. Motorboats make noise, they make wakes. That's why everybody seems to focus on them. We try our best to limit anything that can happen from our wake, but there are times I can put out um, a one foot, two foot wake. That's enough to roll over a kayak enough to impact a small boat if people aren't ready for it. But when you're in a waterway this wide, if I was going someplace in particular, there's going to be a wake. So plan for it and deal with it. Turn your boat a couple degrees into it or away from it and the wake will pass under you. Know how to handle it. When you're out boating, it's a pleasure. It's a recreational activity. So a lot of people do drink. Part of owning a boat and being captain of the boat is the people on it you're responsible for. You gotta drive the boat and keep them safe so you really can't drink. You know, it's fine for your guests to have a cocktail or two, but keep the bottle corked when you're running the boat. It's something that has to be dealt with and enforcement is still part of it. Alcohol-related incidents, though they're less than they were, still exist. If I had one specific suggestion to increase boating safety, it would be very simple. It would be stay focused. Pay attention to what you're doing. It is a serious business and the mistakes have serious consequences. The New York Harbor is becoming one of the top resort areas of the world. People coming here from all over. Anybody that's starting into the motor boating community before they get behind the wheel of a vessel is take a, a safe boating course and understand what the rules of the road are so that they don't go out there and, and create havoc in the harbor. The courses teach you the basics on crossing, overtaking, oncoming situations, and how to deal with them. It's good to know how to read a buoy and how to navigate and how to stay in deep water instead of on the rocks. For a long time, the people were fenced off it didn't want people to get to the river. Now they're opening it up. Things are starting to change. Things are turning around, I think, for the better. And it's in our backyard. That's the neatest thing. To find out where boating safety courses are offered near you, check out the Safe Harbor online. In a harbor like this, it's like being on the New Jersey Turnpike. From people-powered craft to sailing vessels to high-speed ferries that are moving at 40 miles an hour through the harbor. Some critical variables are understanding one another, communicating with one another, respecting one another. Understanding what one another's intentions are is the first part of safety. Anybody that's starting into the motor boating community, the first thing they should do is take a, a safe boating course and understand what the rules of the road are. There's an unwritten rule. It's called the rule of gross tonnage. Big fish eat little fish. You may have the right of way, but you don't want that in your eulogy. Do not cross the bow of a tanker. Cargo ships move fast, can't stop, and can't leave the channel. We have a blind spot 500 meters ahead of the ship. You assume that I see you and I may not. And if your engine goes, you're gone. The tugboats and barges that go around here, you have to know how they operate so you can stay away from them and operate safely. It's really up to the boaters themselves to get out of the way. Sailboats have the right of way. 
I also try to give them space. I don't want them to have to veer off course. Give all sailing vessels plenty of room. Sailors change course quickly, have limited visibility, and are vulnerable when raising sail. When you see a kayak, you gotta stay away from them because any way could turn the, the kayak over and they could be in serious trouble. You can't stress enough how difficult it is to see a kayak. Maximize visibility with brightly colored clothing and boats and use navigation lights at night. Make visual contact with other vessels whenever possible. Stay out of the channel. But when you do interact with other traffic, make your intentions clear and always cross their stern. Know what the river is doing before you hit the water. Currents are a factor. The current on the Hudson can get to three knots. The tide changes every six hours. The weather changes all the time. So check your advisories. Keep an eye on the weather. To be safe, be prepared. Stay alert, be aware, and know how to read the intentions and capabilities of the vessels around you. There are many tribes here. There are those that know what they're doing and those that have no idea what they're doing. There's got to be a way to communicate among all of the parties to see if we can somehow resolve these issues. It's only through that communication that everybody begins to experience this as, as one tribe. We are one tribe, we are mariners. Whether you're in a sailboat or a, a kayaker, um, anybody on the water looks out for everybody on the water. This is uh, it's a good thing to be part of.